Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. <coughs> Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they, were perse they persecuted the prophets who were before you. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? O oh Lord, open our ears and our hearts. Let us hear what we need to hear and show us what we need to do to become more faithful disciples of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. 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 I like to play games. Do you like to play games? Yeah. One of my favorite games to play growing up was Monopoly. I still like to, it's still one of my favorite games to play today. Uh, and I grew up playing it with my grandmother, and from time to time, my great-grandmother would be visiting, and she'd play along with us. Uh, and she didn't know a whole lot of what was going on, except she knew for sure when you landed on one of her properties. She had no idea how much money you owed her. She just knew that you owed her money, and she would stick out her hand every time for whatever you owed her in Monopoly. When we're playing games as children or, or board games as adults or whatever the case may be, it's easy to know when we're doing well at whatever said game we're playing. In Monopoly, it's easy to know when we're doing well, when we have uh, the most properties around the board, when we have the most houses and the most hotels on those properties, especially have, if you have the favorite blue properties of Boardwalk and Park Place uh, there near the end. In a game like Checkers, it's easy to know when we're doing well, when we have more jumps over our opponent than they have uh, over us. And when we play follow the leader as children, it's easy to know when we're doing well. If we go where they go and we do what they do, we're not doing well if we strike off on our own. But in real life, not just the game of life, in real life, it can be different. For the different leaders that we follow in real life often have different sets of rules for us to follow. And sometimes they might conflict with one another. Written rules, and especially those unwritten rules. Sometimes it feels like the goalposts <clears throat> continuously are moved on us as we get ready to kick, or we might even feel like Charlie Brown and we kick the air as Lucy yanks the football out from in front of us at the last possible second. <clears throat> How do we measure success in real life? How do we know that we're doing well in real life? Is it by the size of our bank accounts? Is it our status? Is it our, the size of our house? The destination of our vacations? The quality of our relationships? The number of friends on Facebook or the number of retweets on Twitter or likes or followers on Instagram. And all of these measures and others by which we might measure ourselves in life, typically the bigger the better, the more the merrier. If things are trending up, then we're trending up. And if things are trending down, well, we're probably a little down ourselves. And this happens even and maybe especially in the life of the church. <clears throat> Pastor Jay and I report to our conference and to our bishop and to our district superintendent on a weekly basis certain numbers from our Sunday worship services and our weekly gatherings. We report uh, the worship attendance across all three worship services every Sunday morning, and that gets averaged out over the course of the year. We 
uh, report the numbers of new members that we take in on any given Sunday, and especially the professions of faith, not just those that transfer in from another United Methodist Church. Sometimes we call that stealing sheep. Uh, but uh, to the professions of faith, folks who have never previously ex uh, expressed faith in Jesus Christ or maybe expressing their faith once again for after some period of time. We report dollars collected towards mission, and, and at the end of the year, we have even more numbers to report on our TPS, I mean, I mean end of the year reports uh, to the, the, the conference. And typically, if those numbers are growing, that means things are healthy and things are good. And if things are declining, well, you draw the conclusion there. It's helpful to know where we stand in some of these measures of success in real life. After all, if our income shrinks, but our spending stays the same or increases, those are numbers we kind of need to pay attention to because otherwise we're going to find ourselves in a pickle before we know it. <clears throat> or if our household grows, it's helpful to have a, a larger house and a good, reliable vehicle to, to get around. And even in the church, numbers are important because numbers represent people. One of the numbers I would share with you today is that over the last five years, here at Pender United Methodist Church, we have experienced a 29% decrease in our average worship attendance across all three of our Sunday morning worship services. That translates to 169 people who no longer worship with us. Now some of these folks, in fact a fair number of them, have simply moved out of the area. And they've transferred to another United Methodist Church closer to where they live or another church of another uh, stripe in, the, in, the, in Christendom. Uh, and, and that's great that they're going to church closer to where they live. But, but others have chosen to leave Pender and go to other nearby churches for, for various reasons. And it reflects a broader trend in our denomination and, and in all mainline denominations for all are on this decline. But obviously, we can't use that as an excuse. Well, everyone else is in the same boat, so we're, we're, we're okay. Because obviously, we can't continue down this path for long. And I would hope that we don't want to continue down this path for long. And so I'd share with you that that's part of the commitment of Pastor Jay and myself and our church council as we've set goals this year to reverse that trend and to put us back in a, a positive direction. But the problem as leaders, whether in our jobs or in our family or in our school, in our <coughs> friends, in our church, even just leading ourselves, we can obsess over numbers and statistics. Yes, we have a decline in worship attendance here at Pender, but there are other areas of great health that we have here at Pender as well. When it comes to leading ourselves, it might be your New Year's resolution to lose a few pounds in 2018. And if you're like me, you step on the scale every day and you see those fluctuations. You go, what? How in the world did I gain five pounds in one day? But the, the, the experts tell us not to obsess over those daily numbers, over those little fluctuations. Don't obsess over them. Pay attention to a larger picture that's out there. <coughs> Even worse, we have this human nature that when the numbers of others are going well, they get a promotion and they get the higher salary. They lose the weight and we can't seem to lose the weight, whatever the case may be. If the numbers of others are going well and ours are not, the temptation is to wallow in the despair of comparison. We justify ourselves like Job did in our daily readings this week, crying out to God, why do they prosper and not me? They're the wicked ones. What about me, God? What about us? <coughs> For the many who obsess over numbers and achieving success by those numbers, 
the danger is that those numbers become gospel. Whether it's the stock market or church statistics or anything else we might measure. Once again, however, we profess that we follow a different leader. We at, last, at least give lip service to the importance of inviting others to follow this leader with us, though our numbers might tell a different story. You might remember from last week that this leader is the one who created us, who calls us by name, who washes us clean from sin in the waters of baptism, and reminds us by his Spirit that our identity is not grounded in what we do, but rather in who we are and whose we are as children of God redeemed by Jesus Christ. And so how might this leader, our God, <clears throat> define success? What measures can we measure ourselves by to determine how well we're doing at living according to how God wants us to live, how well we're doing or not in following this leader. As we turn to today's text, Jesus has rather proven himself as a very successful leader by most standards. He's faced down temptation in the wilderness from the devil himself. He's established his home base in Capernaum, a city on a major trade route through the Galilean region. He's called his first disciples. He's healed and he's taught. And his reputation has spread so widely throughout the area that people from literally all over are coming to seek him out and to begin to follow him. And so Matthew begins in chapter 5. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. And the segment of teaching we call the Beatitudes. It begins each line with the word blessed. Blessed. And in some translations, maybe in your translation, if you're reading along this morning, Sometimes it says, happy. Happy are those whom. And we want to point out that that's not just the feeling of feeling happy. Happy, 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 like Phil Robinson likes to say. But it's not a mere feeling, but it's a deep disposition down deep inside. It refers to that deep inner joy of those who have long awaited the salvation promised by God, and who now are experiencing that in Jesus Christ. You might have heard recently about the false alarm that went out in Hawaii this past week. And a pastor that I follow on Twitter said that his wife was visiting Hawaii during that time. And that as other people around her scurried for shelter, she went out on the lanai, on the porch, to watch it come in. That's that kind of deep disposition that we're talking about here. That she is blessed and happy to know that in the face of literal destruction, she knows where she's going. She knows who she is and whose she is. More locally here, we recently celebrated the life here at Pender of a dear, dear woman in the life of Pender Church, Dottie Crisea. And if you knew Dottie, you knew that every time you visited, she always had a smile on her face, no matter what she had else going on in life. Dottie is one who was blessed, who had that happy, deep disposition in her Lord Jesus Christ. Now, some people have interpreted these Beatitudes as commands. If you want to be blessed, be, but become poor in spirit. And certainly that's implied. But also Jesus here <coughs> simply pronouncing a blessing over those for whom these descriptions 
are a very present reality. It's as if Jesus is saying, you want to know what success looks like in my book? Let me tell you. And how do we measure up? Blessed are the poor in spirit. Yet how often do we put our needs and our own desires above others and think more highly of ourselves than we ought? Blessed are those who mourn. Yet in many ways, we insulate ourselves from the pain that surrounds us. Blessed are those who are meek. Yet we try so hard to appear strong and superior to others, especially those who are different <coughs> from us. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Yet sometimes we just want to take the easiest path. Blessed are those who are merciful. Yet there are those of us who'd rather people get what they deserve. Blessed are the pure in heart. Yet so often our hearts are pulled in so many different directions. Blessed are the peacemakers. Yet how often would we rather hold a grudge or turn a blind eye to the violence that surrounds us? Blessed are you who are persecuted on account of Jesus. Yet how often throughout history and even today, as the church, the body of Christ, mistreated, and oppressed others. These standards of Jesus fly in the face of the measures of success of the world around us. It's not about more, but about less. Less of you and of me and more of Jesus. One of my favorite devotional practices is to put my name in the place of Scripture. The, the pastor who married us uh, did that with 1 Corinthians 13. Put your name in place of love and see how you measure up there. And this is a great place to do that as well. Put your name in the place of blessed and see how you measure up. Dave is poor in spirit. Rhonda is meek. Kay hungers and thirsts for righteousness. Put your name in those places in every line and see how you measure up. Or maybe as you've been thinking this morning, God has brought somebody to mind who lived out these Beatitudes as best as they could. Someone that you might emulate in your life. Or maybe you're sitting there thinking, come on, Dan, really? <laughs> no one can live up to these standards. These are practically impossible. Only Jesus can perfectly fulfill all of these nine characteristics. And friends, you are exactly right. And that's the good news, is that none of us can live up to Jesus' standards. But remember, our identity is not in what we try to do, but in how we live in our Lord Jesus Christ who gives us the grace that when we fail at these characteristics, he draws us back to himself again and again and again. He continually offers us forgiveness through Jesus Christ as we pray repentance for our sin. And by his Spirit, he <coughs> sanctifies us. He makes us holy as he is holy even to the point where we might attain perfection in love in this life. 
It's a question asked by every of every person presenting themselves for ordination in the United Methodist Church. Are you going on to perfection? And we say, sure. <laughs> and then do you expect to be made perfect in love in this life? And some people snicker through that. But I heard of a bishop, and Jay, you probably remember this one time, that uh, the bishop, which bishop was it that, that asked this question? Do you know the story I'm telling? He, 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 he asked, everybody snickered, and he said, listen, if you're not going on to perfection, then where are you going? Is this a leader we want to follow that calls us to be perfect as our Father in Heaven is perfect? If so, then let us, by grace, lay down our measures of success at the foot of the cross and take up these measures of holiness laid out for us by Jesus Christ himself.